Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Buzzin Clark, and there's Chuck Zippy Zap Bryant. <laughs> okay. It's just the two of us, so I don't have to come up with any more stupid electricity-based names. Jerry, yeah, the, Jerry, the uh, the gone. F- yeah, she's we don't not know. here. She just zapped off into the ether. Absent. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, we should call roll, Chuck. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, Josh here. Chuck, present. Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> no, she's not here. Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> Uh, dude, I just had a shower today for the first time in a few days because we didn't have water <laughs> at our house. No. And uh, I, I put this on the Movie Crushers page just to get some feedback. I was like, would you rather not have power or water? And that kind of figures into today's episode. And, Great. you know, 98% of the people are very sensible and said would much rather not have power than water. Yeah. But there were a handful of psychopaths that said they'd rather be, <laughs> I guess, just buying Dozens of gallons of water to to flush toilets and wash hands and not bathe. At what point? Stuff. At what point, though, of going without water? And maybe you reach this point, and you can tell me. <laughs> do you get to where you're like, well, we're just going to save water and, and dig a dig a pit and be, <laughs> be into that a latrine? Well, I mean, we were letting the yellow mellow. You know what I'm saying? Unfortunately, but, yes. Uh, you know, the brown you got to flush down. <laughs> you should trademark that. And it really hits home how much uh, water a toilet uses when you have to fill it up yeah. with those huge, like, arrowhead five-gallon jugs. Yeah. And it's just shameful, but, you know, I'm, I was happy to take that shower, I got to tell you. Yeah. But you go through three of those five-gallon jugs before you realize that you're accidentally stepping on the handle and they're just going right down the drain. <laughs> and you're like, man, this is not my week. But this isn't about water. It's about power. Which, you know, it's a, it's a really good question. And I'm not surprised that the, the, um, you got the response that you got from it. Because, yeah. like, we, we tend to think of, like, you know, electricity is, you know, a really nice modern luxury. And that is basically not the case anymore. For most of the climates in the United States, electricity yeah. is an absolute necessity. It's not a luxury. Like, you need it to survive in the modern world. You could try to do the Ted Kaczynski thing, go off grid. People do it successfully. But even then, if you look into what they're doing, I would guess something in the neighborhood of 90% of those people are still using something like solar power or wind power. They just aren't connected to this grid that we're going to talk about today. Yeah, and I should caveat, the question I posed to the movie crushers was whether aside, like obviously in the hot, hot summer, people can and do die from mm-hmm. outages, and in the winter they do as well. Yeah. But it was, uh, you know, that wasn't the case here in Atlanta, although it is cold today. Weirdly. Yeah, it, it is very cold. But, I mean, not deadly cold, but it, it gets deadly cold once in a while here. Um, but even beyond, like, heating and cooling just to stay alive, like, electricity is so interwoven with our lives that— it, you know, you, you're like, okay, I could wash dishes by hand. You know, mm-hmm. it's not my preference, but whatever. Or, um, you know, I can I can use the old gas-powered lawnmower instead of the electric lawnmower. But there's also, like, can you keep up in school or at work without, you know, electricity? Mm-hmm. The, like, it's it's really just a, a, it's a fundamental necessity in, in modern industrial life. And um, we get this based on this huge, sprawling, rickety old black and white cartoon donkey of an engineering marvel that we call the electrical grid. It's crazy how held together with like duct tape and bubble gum this thing is, but it still literally delivers the juice for us. Yeah, and it is funny how we, it's so like power and water, you know, here in the United States is so ingrained. It's just something we kind of take for granted that when you don't have it, is the only time you notice and, like, the only fun thing about the past few days was hearing Emily scream from another room because, you know, your instinct is, oh, I have grease on my finger. <laughs> Let me go wash it off. And just hearing her, like, flick, uh, you know, some faucet or something somewhere in the house uh-huh. 
over the past three days and nothing comes out because you just forget. <laughs> Same when the power's off. You're constantly flicking a switch and going, yeah. ah! I hate life. It's not there. Yeah, well, but that's why you'll see in a lot of different, like, power companies' um, names the word reliability because yeah, that right. is key. Like, you can't have, <laughs> you know, an electric company that's just kind of like, oh, we work a, a lot of the time, you know? Don't right. we get credit for that? It's like, no. People want you to work basically 100% of the time. Um, you don't want to sign up for a company that's called partial credit. Right, exa- exactly. <laughs> you want you want the full credit one, the real ambitious types that like right. where their hands shoot up into the air at every question. That's the kind of energy company you want. So should we talk about this big antiquated system? Yeah. So like I said, it's considered a modern marvel. And part of the reason why it's considered a modern, modern marvel is just from its sheer enormous size. Yeah, I mean, big time. We're talking... <clears throat> Uh, 19,000 generators, mm-hmm. and in this case, it is literally generating the power like a coal plant or a natural natural gas plant or a wind farm, that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, 55,000 substations, transmission substations, and we'll, we've talked about this before and we'll get to it later, but this is when you're stepping up and stepping down power to get it in and out of your house. Mm-hmm. Or I guess not out of your house. It only comes in. It depends. If you have a good solar array and like a power true. company that wants your stuff, true, you can actually. sell the excess stuff. <laughs> it's rare. Uh, 642,000 miles of um, transmission lines. It's a lot. 6.3 million miles of distribution lines. Mm-hmm. And these are like the power poles, unless you're lucky enough to have buried power lines. I know. It looks so much better. They're doing that actually in our neighborhood finally. Oh, and uh, they approached us with a, a dollar figure to say, can we put this huge, big green thing in your front yard? <laughs> mm. And we said, thank you, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, try someone else. Yeah, you're, you're like, not these neighbors. We like them. But three doors down, they really suck. <laughs> so try them. Well, I mean, some it doesn't have to go in our yard. So I think they're just taking volunteers who want to make a little scratch. Mm-hmm. But you can't, like, plant bushes in front of it or anything. And our front yard is very exposed. It would look really bad. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about what those are. But they are so seriously dangerous too if you end up getting into one of those the one the things that kids play on all the time yeah it's crazy <laughs> those are really really dangerous basically mini power stations they're transformers yeah. they just happen so, to be like on the ground rather than up on a pole where everybody's used to them yeah i mean i felt kind of bad at first because i thought am i not doing my part to make sure our neighborhood gets buried mm-hmm. but they said that you know they're it doesn't have to go there, and they can just – that. there are a lot of people that are going to want that, what, however much money it was. Were they like, okay, well, you know, we understand your decision, but we noticed you have an empty lot behind your house, <laughs> and you're like, keep walking. I heard oh, about dude, you, you know what's funny? What? We found out uh, once we assumed the, that property that we were squatting on mm-hmm. that two weeks later, Georgia Power got in touch with them. So No, I know. That's why I made that joke. But that was exactly what was going to happen. Right, yeah. For It's that. not a joke. <laughs> I know, but I was joking about how close you came. Oh, goodness me. All right, so let's talk about the, the nationwide network. Uh, and when we're talking about this, keep in mind, we're talking about the lower 48. Um, obviously, Hawaii and Alaska have their own grids and systems. Yeah, they were strangely left out of this, the poor, poor deers. Yeah, but we're thinking about them. Yeah. But on the lower 48, we have... Uh, Basically, three big separate grids that are called interconnections. And really, it should just be two. There should be the eastern interconnection, which is basically everything west of the Rockies, or east of the Rockies. A lot of the um, Great Plains states up to the northeast, the southeast, all that is the eastern connection. Then you've got the western interconnection, which is west of the Rockies. And then you've got Texas. Those are the three interconnections of the United States electrical grid. Yeah, here's my question. Is it is Texas literally no longer connected at all? No. That's the so big, like it, the big okay. rub about the whole thing. They're connected to God and everybody. They're connected to Mexico. Mexico saved their tuchus in 2011. They're connected to everybody. They just somehow are being left out of the law. It's ridiculous. No, but they are connected. Yes. Lit- like, okay. Yes. Because I was going to say, is it the lower 47? But... Technically, they are connected, but they're just, Texas is going to do Texas. No, and there's even, that's exactly right. And then there's even parts of Texas, including El Paso and some parts of the Panhandle that are connected to either the eastern or the western interconnection. But most of Texas, by far, is its own interconnection, its own separate basic grid. Yeah. Yeah. 
Even, no, even uh, more than that. I would say it's probably closer to like 95 or 98 percent, like almost all of it. Uh, okay. All right. Well, this is good, though, that we're interconnected. Uh, and there are a lot of big benefits to that, chief of which is probably reliability, because when you have such an interconnected grid, um, you, you can work together. And there's a lot of backups and redundancies built in. So if there's a big demand in one place or if power goes down in one place, you can reroute and have uh, get some help from your neighbors, basically. Right, exactly. Um, and that actually came about, as we'll see, from a little bit of um, deregulation. Uh, but also it kind of developed from, from power producers realizing like, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. There's also right. flexibility, right? Mm-hmm. So if you have like a bunch of different sources, say you've got a wind farm offshore in, in um, Florida, and then you also have, uh, you're getting power from like a, a dam in Georgia, and mm-hmm. all of these are providing power to the southeast, and you have all sorts of coal-fired power, power plants and nuclear power plants, you can kind of put all these together into an energy portfolio, and all of them are providing electricity to the grid. So the fact that it's like interconnected, it can accept uh, electrical um, production from generators all over the place and from different varieties and types. But as far as you're concerned, it's all just it all just turns into electricity after it's generated. Right. Uh, and then the last advantage is affordability. And this is kind of what you were hinting at. You know, deregulation sort of has giveth and taken away mm-hmm. in some ways. Uh, yeah. Starting in the 80s, the grid was open to wholesale competition and private power companies started investing in certain efficiencies and that made that did really make electricity affordable in the US mm-hmm. but it also when it comes to like like insulating pipelines like Texas did not do um it makes companies more reticent to invest in money like that cuz they're like you know why would we want to unline our pockets right, you know exactly. what i'm saying and so you put all this stuff together, you put the power generation plants, you put the transmission lines, you put the distribution networks that all go into like people's homes and businesses and, and end up as like an outlet or a socket or something like that. And that all together, all those components is the electrical grid. And that's, that's it. Ta-da. So let's take a break and um, we'll come back and talk a little bit about the history of the grid. How about that? Let's do it. Okay. Chuck, also, before we talk about the history, I want to direct everybody to what I think is one of our better science-based episodes, How Electricity Works. Yeah, that was a good one. We cover some of this stuff in there, but, um, like, we really got into electricity. It was uh, electrifying. (laughs) Boo. You laughed. (laughs) I know. I'm just laughing because you're my friend. Thanks, man. I I can't punch you right now because you're (laughs) in a different place. Yeah, that's true. I probably uh, wouldn't so, have yeah. tried that joke. Were we in the same room? <laughs> right. You, you learned from the last one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and I know we talked, like you said, about part of this in uh, electricity, but th- our earliest power grids were built in the 1880s, and they were all very local and specific. Mm-hmm. And this was a time and place when Edison and Tesla were duking it out in a very public, sometimes grotesque way to prove that their, uh, in Edison's case, DC system or Tesla's AC uh, alternating current system was better and gruesome, meaning electrifying large animals. I know, man. That SOB. You always got to say that, right? Oh, yeah. He should go down in history as being reviled for that. Yeah, he's a terrible guy in that respect, for sure. Uh, But Tesla (laughs) won out um, in large part due to a lot of uh, financial backing from George Westinghouse. Right. Um, But not just that. Like, direct current uh, has— It was better. In some ways, but it also has some serious disadvantages to alternating current, which was the Tesla-Westinghouse version. Mm -hmm. And— 
we'll talk about exactly why, but just, you know, remember that alternating current is way better for long-distance transmission. So yeah. the fact that we went with alternating current meant that we could create this huge extensive uh, grid with hundreds of thousands or millions of miles of transmission and distribution line. That's all thanks to Nikola Tesla's alternating current. That's right. So early part of the 20th century, there were about 4,000 individual electric utilities mm -hmm. Uh, with all these tiny grids, and then World War II rolls around, and there's a big spike in demand for more power because it was just after World War II. There was a big boon, lots lots of new appliances and fancy new things mm -hmm. that needed power, and uh, the smaller little independent grids looked at each other and said, I guess we got to hold hands now. <laughs> and start working together to, to meet this demand. Yeah, there was this really big push to electrify America that FDR took up pretty early in his presidency. And he, like, took on these really, like, powerful electric utilities and got a bunch of black eyes as a result of it, but ended up mm -hmm. winning, um, passing the Federal Power Act of 1935, which basically put a leash on the um, the holding companies that there was like a handful of very large, powerful holding companies that basically ran electricity in the United States. Um, and they weren't really innovating. They weren't doing much to, to electrify the U.S. So the federal government got involved and um, basically took over and said, we're going to regulate you guys from now on. And the United States became um, very much electrified, like as a whole country. But in return for this, it wasn't just the the um, nanny state taking away from the, the corporate state. They said, how about this? We'll give you guys monopolies that we're going to keep a really close eye on and we're going to mm -hmm. regulate strongly, but you guys can make your costs back and a reasonable profit. And yeah. so owning an electric company became... Um, it was like printing your own money. You, it, mm -hmm. you know, like you had so many customers that you were making gobs of money. And every year, your your growth, the growth of, the growth of the entire industry was about 8% each year. That's really good. And it yeah. was also money in the bank. They knew that America was just going to keep consuming and consuming and consuming. So they would just build more and more power plants. And they were just going to sit back and collect 8% a year. And actually, everybody was happy. There's a lot of innovation and everything. Um, but one of the things that these different power monopolies learned early on is that everyone expected power on demand 24 hours a day. If yeah. somebody wanted to plug their vacuum cleaner in at 3 a.m., they better have power. There wasn't like mm -hmm. downtime that these guys could factor in. And as we'll see, there was no storage capacity. That's something that we need to get that we don't have, which means that power has to be generated constantly and you also have to have backup power. It was really, really expensive to build a backup power station. And so these early um, companies figured out that they could buy power from other rival companies that had some surplus right then, cheaper than it would be for them to generate it or to build a backup generating plant. And in this way, the, the early independent grids started to connect to one another to kind of buy and sell power as needed. And this kind of wholesale power market developed. And that's where the grid started to connect together. Right. And we should also point out that in 1935, with the passing of the Federal Power Act, that's when Texas said, nah. Yeah. Said, we're we're going to do our own thing. We're going to make our own power. We're going to keep our own power. And we're going to have our own uh, our own body to oversee it called the uh, ERCOT, the Electric Reliability <laughs> Council of Texas. Millions of listeners just went, boo, hiss. <laughs> uh, they created that in 1970, and they manage about 90% of the grid in Texas. Right. And um, we use a lot of power in this country. Um, I think the U.S. consumed, this is a couple of years ago, in 2019, 3.9 trillion kilowatt hours, mm -hmm. which is about 13,000 kilowatt hours per human. And you'd think like, oh, that's got to be the most in the world. There's about a dozen countries ahead of us, but those are countries where it can get really, really cold or really, really hot. Not places like the United States where comparatively to other places like us, we use a lot more per person. Yeah, so 13,000 kilowatt hours per person. It sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. But in Iceland, they use 53,000 kilowatt hours per person on average. They got to heat those saunas. Isn't that crazy? But for, for in their defense, they're uh, making most of that electricity from geothermal. Right, of so, course. 
who cares? Use as much electricity as you want. And then we, I know some of our other listeners don't just live in the U.S., so Canada actually beats the United States in per capita consumption. They use 15.6 thousand kilowatt hours. Australia's um, better at it than we are. They uh, use 10,000. New Zealand's 9,000 nice. kilowatt hours. And then for our three German listeners, <laughs> 7,000 kilowatt hours. And, oh. and then in the U.K., I think it's about 5,000 kilowatt hours Wunderbar. per person. Yeah, exactly. Welcome, bienvenue. <laughs> what was that? Cabaret, I think. Okay. Oh, yeah, it is cabaret. I think it's like the opening of it. Uh, I just know Cabaret from uh, Schitt's Creek. Right, same here. <laughs> I mean, I <laughs> was familiar watch it with it before, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's where I, I've seen most of Cabaret from that episode of Schitt's Creek. Yeah, Emily and I both are like, we need to see Cabaret, though, now. Dude, I started watching um, What We Do in the Shadows again from the, the beginning. TV show? Yes, it, it's so... <laughs> it's one of the best comedies ever it, put it on television. Yeah, and it's sort of a rare case of taking a movie, changing the cast up for television, and it's just as good. Yeah, yeah. Like I the would, movie was great. The TV show was great. I, 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 I have to admit, I haven't seen all of the movie, but from what I saw of the movie, I prefer the TV show. I love them both. I think for a good six months after the TV show, we would walk around the house saying, this effing guy. <laughs> about like every dude that we saw. Every single character. And it's just so, per it's just great. Thank you, people who made what we do in the shadows. <laughs> Thank you, Jermaine. Uh, it is wonderful. So as far as what we use that power for here in the States, uh, and I guess this is lower 48. Who knows what they're doing in Alaska and Hawaii. <laughs> But 38% of that power consumption is residential, people like you and I, sure. and or you and me. Or and we. the bulk of that is, 44% of that is, is heating and cooling our homes and making hot water Makes for sense, showers. For sure. Or washing dishes. And then the rest is, you know, running appliances, charging your laptop, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, the other 61.5% is non-residential stuff, commercial things like office buildings, and then industrial, which is mostly um, used for uh, running motors or, because America loves its lathes. <laughs> I thought of that earlier, and I was like, oh, yeah, I've, I've seen pictures of lathe accidents before. So I spent a good 20 minutes looking at lathe accident photos. Oh, my Lord. Which I do not recommend, but I didn't see that coming up when I started researching this. I used a lathe back in uh, industrial arts in high school. Dude, once I found out how dangerous those things were, I would never go near. get near one. That's You have all your baseball bats made by someone else now. <laughs> right, yeah. I sub <laughs> out the, that, that part of my life. So uh, the, good, the good news is with energy efficiencies, uh, they've really come a long way over the past couple of decades. The, the whole Energy Star program and just appliances being made much more efficiently than they used to be. Um, it's only going to increase, I think, uh, the demand by 1% a year from now to 2050, which is good, but that's still 31% increase, which is a lot. But it's astounding that as we keep consuming more and more electricity, and we do, um, we we use a lot, they figured out, like, these Americans are nuts. They're just going to keep consuming and consuming. We better figure out how to make our stuff more energy efficient, and that they've managed to offset all but 1% of that growth per year. Because I can Pretty only good. imagine if we were still working with, you know, 1930s-style blenders and vacuum cleaners, Good Lord, we'd be sucking the cold directly out of the earth, like straight into your vacuum cleaner. It'd be so use so wasteful. Yeah, and I imagine that they are always working on this. Like I, I assume the goal is to have the negative number there, don't you think? From your lips to God's ear, Chuck. <laughs> like wouldn't that be great if they were like it's gonna go down by two or three percent per year? I I mean, that, that would be great. That's actually, hopefully, we're going to talk a lot about how to fix the grid. And one of the suggestions is to create the smart grid. And one of the big mm -hmm. components of it is to basically allow you and me, we, or I, <laughs> and you, <laughs> to see how much electricity we use through interfaces that are similar to, like, online banking. Like, we would, we would, be, in, we would be aware and managing our electricity use with that level of, like, 
minute interface, right? And that by doing that, we would start to consume less. It would be certainly less wasteful. So it's possible that we might go down compared to like 2020 levels. Who knows? That'd be great. It would be wonderful. Uh, One of the big changes about, uh, I think like basically all of the uh, coal, nuclear, and renewable resources we have in this country are consumed most of it for creating energy, and I think about a third of natural gas. Uh, but natural gas has been a big boon. Um, we did an episode on fracking, mm-hmm. and say what you want about it, but there is a lot more natural gas now. Um, it has lowered the cost. Gas-fired generators are cheaper to build. They burn cleaner than coal do. Yeah, by half. They're more nimble. They can respond quicker to big uh, increases in demand. Uh, so it's gone up, I think, from 1990 to 2019, from 12% of our energy mix to 38%. Yeah, and we should probably just say for full disclosure, um, we are deeply underwritten as a podcast by both Enron and Exxon. (laughs) So just heads up on that one. Fracking tops. Yes. Um, So uh, when you do generate uh, electricity, you're not actually, you don't create energy. Electricity is an energy carrier, right? Which is why it's like it all turns into the same thing from all these different sources. Um, But the people who run the grid have figured out like there's specific kinds of generation plants you want to run. There's basically three of them. One is base load, which is your average, say, usually coal fire power plant that's running almost all the time, and that provides the vast majority of the electricity that's being consumed at any given point. Then there's load following plants, which are um, at this time natural gas power plants, but they may overtake gas or coal in the United States at some point. Those yeah. are a little more... Um, a little less frequently run if you're like, I think we're going to need some more some more juice because it's Christmas time and everybody's got their lights up. You might spark up the old load, load following plants. And then lastly, there's one called peaker plants, like a peak, like at, at peak capacity, where mm-hmm. when you start this up, you're basically like burning diamonds. It's so expensive to run these things. And that means that this, the demand has gone crazy and the prices are going sky high. So turn up the peaker plant because we need that extra capacity. Yeah, and just quickly to tick through where we get the rest of these, uh, the rest of the fuel sources, I said natural gas is 38%, coal is 23%, mm-hmm. nuclear is 20 wind is 7 hydroelectric is 7 biomass is 2%. Solar 1.8%, which is still pretty low considering how many people have gotten on that train. I would say it's objectively shameful. Yeah, that, it'd be nice to see that number go up. Yeah. But um, there are 145 million households and businesses connected to this grid in the U.S. And the reason it all works, and we talked about this, it's still just amazing to me how it all works. Uh, we talked about it in, in electricity, but mm-hmm. the ability to send electricity over long distances and step it up and step it down to make it power your coffee machine is a modern miracle. It's amazing. Right. And that's one of the big advantages of uh, alternating current electricity. It's, I guess you can do it with DC, but it's way more difficult and way more expensive. So for all intents and purposes, it, it's AC that you can step up and step down. And when, when you do that, you do it because uh, current, which is the flow of electrons like down a line, um, is inversely proportionate to what's called voltage, right? Yeah, it's a little confusing. It is. Voltage is kind of like the pressure you put on a line, like the pressure of the flow where the, where the current is the actual flow, right? And mm-hmm. if you have a very high current of electricity, you unfortunately get a lot of resistance on the transmission lines. And when you have a lot of resistance, you lose a lot of electricity to heat, But fortunately for power generators, um, if you up the voltage, right, up the pressure Mm -hmm. that you're putting on the line, it actually decreases the current. And if you decrease the current, then you decrease the energy loss. So they figured out that if they can take, you know, when they generate the stuff at at power plants, it's like 2,000 volts, maybe up to 20,000 volts. But then they step up the voltage to hundreds of thousands of volts. I think some transmission lines are able to take about 750,000 volts, 
which is that's amazing. It is like if you get shocked by like a, a, a electrical socket in your house. That's 120 volts. This is 750,000 volts. Um, the current goes down so dramatically that you lose almost none of the electricity over very, very long distances of transmission. So that's really a huge benefit of alternating current that you can step them up. And then when you get toward neighborhoods and stuff, step them back down. Yeah, I think they lose about 6% of electricity generated in the United States, uh, which, you know— that's a fairly low number, but I think they're always trying to make that better. Yeah, because, I mean, let's see, somewhere else, where is that number? There's a um, – we we do something like 35 – no, 4.5 trillion kilowatt hours are generated in the United States. So, 6%, so 6% of that, that is yeah. lost. That's an astounding amount of electricity that's lost. Any improvement on that would be huge. Yeah, that'd be great. Um so in your house, like you said, you have uh, here in the States, we have 120 volts. So you have these substations that step it down to about 12,000. Then it goes to your power lines. And then those, you know, those gray um, sort of cylindrical cans mm-hmm. at the top of the things, those are very important. They step it down even further to about 240. Then by the time you get into your house, it's down to 120 mm-hmm. and you're I was about to say you're cooking with gas, but you're not. (laughs) You're cooking with electricity. Nice. Um, Yeah, so those gray can transformers are the same thing as that green uh, death box that they wanted to put in your front yard, except the green death box, it's called a pad pad mount transformer. (laughs) That's for underground power lines. The gray cans are for overhead lines, but they do the same thing. They step it down to a much less deadly and much more usable um, voltage of electricity. Yeah, we have a lot of, you know, Atlanta just has a lot of outages, period, because we have a, it's a city in a forest, and we have a ton of trees, Mm -hmm. a ton of really old trees, like most of the, not most, but a lot of the old oak trees in Atlanta are coming down, or at the very least, large limbs are coming down, and uh, it's it's a problem. So, my neighborhood, especially, we have a lot of blackouts, so hopefully this, this burying the lines project will work out pretty well. Yeah, the tree thing, it's its important. It's like kind of part of that whole reliability thing, as we'll see, is keeping trees trimmed away from power lines. Yeah, which is why a power company might knock on your door one day and say, hi, we need to to cut a lot of your tree back. Right. And you have to say yes. Well, yeah, they they, they might not even say that. They might just show up and start cutting your tree and, and be like, That's what true. are you going to do about it? <laughs> and I'm just like, that was uncalled for. Uh, should we take another break? <laughs> sure. Before you get in another fight with a power person? Yeah, they started it, Chuck. All right. Well, we'll take a break and we'll come back and talk about all this gobbledygook a little bit more. All righty. So you mentioned earlier the monopoly situation that was broken up um, largely because of the energy crisis of the 1970s. And we said, hey, let's open it up. Let's get the market going and get some competitive pricing happening. Mm-hmm. And everyone did that. And uh, well, Not everyone. In the Southeast, we still have a lot of the big, big utility companies. But um, they still needed some sort of oversight. And there are a lot of different ways that these things are regulated. Uh, if you look at a state level, you're going to be regulated by a public utility commission or a public service commission. Mm-hmm. And then when you start horse trading and Alabama says to Georgia, hey, we need some power. And you're like, wait, I'm getting some power from Tennessee right now. Hold on the other line. Mm-hmm. That's got to be regulated, too. So the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission oversees those transactions. The FERC. Yes, F-E-R-C. So they're supposed to, as we'll see, they they fall down on the job kind of frequently and huge catastrophic things happen when they do. <laughs> um, but yeah, so when they started to be regulated, especially in the, se- or deregulated in the 70s, strangely enough, it was 
Jimmy Carter's administration who opened up competition. You would think that would have been a squarely a Ronald Reagan kind of thing. But Carter did it to encourage conservation um, of energy and to create that competition to see who could who could deliver this this stuff and kind of innovate more. Um, just basically shake up the stodgy old energy companies. But the yeah. problem is, is remember I said like it was money in the bank. You could just kick back and expect 8% growth year over year every single year and people were just going to keep using electricity. All of a sudden, there's a totally new mindset in America, which was, whoa, 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 we're using way too much electricity and energy. We need to conserve. And now all these power companies started kind of losing money. And when they started to lose money, they stopped doing important things like cutting down trees um, or, or cutting down off tree limbs or servicing their lines as much. Like all the stuff that made them more reliable um, – just stopped happening quite as frequently. And so you started to see things like enormous, massive blackouts that, you know, affected millions of people for days where you didn't really see that that often before. I think the first one ever was in 1965, but um, the really big ones uh, started coming more frequently around about 2000, I think, uh, that was kind of kicked off by the California energy crisis. And then, you know, we were talking about the regulatory bodies. Um, Those were just for the public utilities themselves. Mm -hmm. Then you have these transmission networks, and they have to be managed as well. And um, I think FERC stepped in and said, we need some sort of independent management and oversight here uh, because basically we got to make sure that everyone has equal access to this grid. Right. And so these interconnections that we talked about, those three interconnections, they're divided uh, divided up into more than a dozen independent nonprofits um, that are called regional transmission organizations or independent system operators. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the idea there is they're just, they're not in it for the money. They're there to kind of really just make sure everyone is being treated fairly and doing the right thing. Right. That everybody has access to the grid that's supposed to get access to the grid, but also it's a, they're also the modern incarnation of those power pools where like, um, like utilities would, would buy and sell power to one another yeah. as needed. These are the groups that kind of oversee those transactions. Right. So you mentioned the grid failing in California. Uh, I was there at the time, and I remember in uh, I remember these rolling blackouts. California in the late 90s and early 2000s, early aughts, mm-hmm. um, had to institute these emergency rolling blackouts. Uh, and I, I remember when I was living there a couple of times, it was all over the news, you know, it was big, big news. Mm-hmm. And I remember a couple of times like, you know, losing power because they just had to. Yeah, so there was, um, the, 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 I guess, California, and Enron actually makes an appearance. Every time there was a huge, colossal blackout, you could mm-hmm. trace that, its origins back a couple of years to Enron lobbying to get somebody, de- to get things deregulated, get a wholesale market built up. And they managed to do that in California. Um, and California found itself in this weird position where the really big utility companies like PG&E um, or Southern California Edison um, were they they were capped at how much they could charge retail for mm-hmm. energy for electricity, but at the same time in this new uh, wholesale market. Um, they had to buy electricity, and it wasn't being regulated. Remember I said that right. FERC sometimes falls down on the job? Well, they weren't regulating this wholesale market in California like they were supposed to. And so one day in the summer, uh, or one month, I should say, starting in June of, of 2000, the wholesale prices went through the roof. It went from about 30 bucks the year before to 375 bucks a megawatt hour in 2000. And... All of a sudden, PG&E is having to pay through the nose for this energy, but they can't pass the the cost along to their customers. And yet, they're also legally obligated to continue to to provide electricity to their customers. So, they found themselves in this impossible situation. Some people still today say that they turned off the power because they didn't have the supply. Um, But they, they swear that they did not do that and that they just ran out of supply because they couldn't get it any longer. Well, yeah, and as a result, PG&E and uh, Southern Cal Edison, they were financially strapped. So they were in a situation where they had independent energy suppliers in surrounding states that were like, I know you guys are in trouble, but 
I don't want to sell you my stuff because I don't know that I'm going to get paid back now. Right. So California was in a bind in the early aughts. And um, there were also technical problems and stuff. I think there was uh, low water levels in the Pacific Northwest. Which was huge because California at the time, I don't know if there is it's different now. They were not self-sufficient energy-wise. They depended on the surplus of other states. Yeah. So, you know, if there was low water levels in the Pacific Northwest, that's less electricity being sent south. Mm-hmm. And they also basically had these high voltage power lines from Southern California to Northern California, and they were crashing. They were failing because they were just overburdened, basically. So they said, we got to do these rolling blackouts. And I think the biggest one was March 2001 affected about 1.5 million customers. Yeah. And like you said, that they uh, these independent energy producers wouldn't sell them electricity because they didn't think they were going to get paid back. The whole thing finally ended when the governor uh, had the the water board, uh, the state water board, go buy energy or electricity on behalf of them because the, the state was, you know, the state had a good enough credit to buy electricity, but their two biggest electricity utilities didn't have a good enough credit. Isn't that crazy? Who was the governor back Gray then? I'm Davis? trying to remember. Yeah, Gray Davis. I was like, was that the governor? No, I think he was just after Gray Davis, wasn't he? <laughs> and then I thought, was Arnold Schwarzenegger actually the governor? Yeah, for of years. California? For years. It was, I mean, that was after I left. Uh, just, yeah, it was just after I left. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was, he was, geez, 2003, 2011. At the same time that Jesse the Body Ventura was the governor of Minnesota. No way, man. All we needed was Carl Weathers as the governor of Georgia and um, Billy. Rowdy Roddy Piper. Yeah. No, no, I'm doing Predator here. Oh, okay. Got, uh, I missed that. I then. can't remember the guy who played Billy. Or maybe who, just who the spooked. Predator. Sure. The Predator was president <laughs> like, in 2005. President. <laughs> Don't you know? Uh I haven't seen that movie in so long. I bet your Predator holds up. Yeah, I saw it in the last few years, and it does. Yeah? Yep. I'll check that out. Uh, there was a big blackout in the Northeast. <clears throat> I remember this one as well in 2003. Uh, this was big time. This was 50 million people uh, in the U.S. and even parts of Canada lost power for a couple of days in some case. 11 deaths. And this one, like, it was like a movie or something, how, how this one started. Yeah. the There was... Uh, remember I said that tree cutting kind of fell to the wayside a little bit when they yeah. stopped making as much money? Well, that's what happened here. It was really, really hot, and there was a lot of demand, and those lines were just blazing, so much so that they actually started to sag. Like, the the atomic composition of the metal was put under that much stress, and they sagged into a tree, brim, a tree branch and arced, which is basically like lightning is produced, right? Mm-hmm. There was this teenager in Ohio who noticed that um, his outlets were smoking throughout his house. (laughs) And it just so happened that there was a tree-cutting crew outside of his house on the other side of the street, and he ran out to tell them, and they basically told him to get lost. And hours and hours went by, uh, and there was a bunch of cascading power failures, which normally would have been caught, right? But there was some human error involved. Yeah, this was the sort of the movie part. I mean, it might as well have been like a rat chewing on a wire or something. Mm-hmm. There was there's monitoring software that, like you said, it's usually like, hey, emergency, something's going on. But the software uh, was being glitchy, and so a technician with, I guess, like mustard stains on his shirt <laughs> turns it off, tries to fix it, and forgets to turn it back on. Yeah, that's crazy. Yep. And so because the the power grid is especially interconnected up in the Northeast, this power outage in Ohio meant that there was um, power outages in Pennsylvania and elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And I think, did you say 11 people died? 11 people died. Um, so, you know, the, U, the federal regulator stepped in and was like, we need a catchy new slogan to improve this. And so how about the three T's, trimming, training, and tools? Mm-hmm. And everyone rolled their eyes Fine. and said, whatever, boomer. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll get on those three T's. <laughs> they just Too sweet. turned the volume up on Wichita Lineman, which is the only song they ever <laughs> yeah. listened to over and over the, again. The fourth T was Too Sweet. <laughs> nice. nice. Uh, so now Texas. Uh, we're in Texas. We're not literally in Texas, but uh, we're in Texas now in spirit because very recently 
a big freak winter storm hit, mm-hmm. as everyone knows. Mm-hmm. And everyone needed a lot more heat than they usually do at this time of year in Texas. I think they usually require about 67,000 megawatts a day in the winter. That's what they plan for. Yeah, compared to 86,000 megawatts in the summer. Mm -hmm. And all of this makes sense. We're not saying like, you're wrong, Texas, for not, you know, being ready for this weird freak storm. I mean, that was the cause of it. But you also have to take into consideration that, uh, like we said, some of those lines weren't insulated like they should have been because of money. Mm -hmm. And wind and solar is not going to work as well in the winter anyway. And I think those... Wind farms weren't winterized as well, right? Yeah, some of them did. Apparently, a surprising number um, kept spinning. Um, but the, the the big problem was the gas pipelines freezing over. So instead of the um, planned for 67,000 megawatts of power, they ended up with um, 31,000 because of those failures in the actual system. So they had 30,000 megawatts. They needed a lot more than that. Uh, They probably needed about 50,000 more megawatts than they had. And so all of a sudden, power just started going out. And Texas supposedly isn't connected to anything, so Texas went dark, and everybody Mm -hmm. started to get very cold and couldn't cook and couldn't, um, couldn't boil water couldn't take showers to basically live in a very, they lived in a very dangerous situation because this is sub-freezing temperatures. And these areas are not set up for that kind of thing. Yeah, and if you want to get your uh, feathers ruffled and get a little riled up, go read this uh, New York Times article about the exorbitant um, power bills that some of these people got Yeah, that were able to stay online. There's a 63-year-old Army vet who had to pay $16,000 for his monthly bill which wiped out his entire savings. Um, A lot of people were reportedly, um, including this guy, customers of a company called Gritty, (laughs) G-R-I-D-D-Y. Okay. Uh, I mean, you have to laugh at a name like that. But they um, provide electricity at wholesale prices. And the the deal with Gritty is it really quickly changes based on supply and demand. Mm -hmm. So they sell it to the customers as, hey, we're going to pass this wholesale price directly to you. Uh, for a low nine ninety nine monthly fee, mm-hmm. and the rate's going to fluctuate, but it's really no big deal because it fluctuates just sort of reasonably. Um, they saw this huge jump coming apparently, and they encouraged their customers twenty nine thousand people to switch to another provider when the storm came, which is just not that easy to do. Right, and uh, a lot of it is through an app. A lot of people are like literally connected to their bank, so people would literally watch. Eight, ten, yeah. twelve thousand dollars drain out of their bank account before their very eyes, and they can't do anything about it. And uh, the architect of the uh, Texas Energy Grid, his name is uh, where is it here? William Hogan. He said, "You know what? This thing is. Uh, it worked exactly like it was supposed to, because high prices reflected the market performing as it was designed." Mm-hmm. And um, he said, "As you get closer and closer to the bare minimum, these prices get higher and higher, which is what you want." What is that and, guy's nickname, Milton Friedman? <laughs> I mean, how heartless. But I, yes, it's true uh, in fact, but it's a pretty heartless way to look at it, you know? Yeah, and I think Governor Abbott has stepped in and said, like, wait a minute, but we can't, people can't be going broke, like paying for like three and four years worth of energy in a single month. Well, that's the opposite of what the the um, George W. Bush said when he was governor of Texas in 1998, he passed a bill that said, you have to pay whatever the the energy company charges you as a consumer. Yeah. So I'm not sure what they're going to do, if they can retroactively reimburse some of these people, but it's, um, I don't know. That's horrifying, man. 16 grand. I know, especially when it's taken direct. Like, this isn't even like a, well, hold on, hold on. I'm not going to pay this yet. I want to talk this over. It's like, that's gone. Now I have to go try to get it back. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, that's terrible stuff. So sorry, Texas, that that happened. But the other thing about it, Chuck, too, is like, you know, yeah, they they weren't prepared for it. And it was a freak winter storm that just doesn't happen. But a lot of people are saying, hey, welcome to the age of climate change. This is not just a freak storm anymore. This stuff is actually going to keep happening. And 
Texas had virtually the same thing happen in 2011, mm-hmm. and there was a there was a, a panel um, that was created to figure out how to prevent that from happening again. They gave ERCOT a whole list of things to do, including like winterization, like insulating their pipes. ERCOT didn't do it, and it happened yeah. again. So yeah. I think Texas's patience with ERCOT not listening to that kind of stuff has probably reached an end. So how do we fix this stuff? You mentioned uh, the smart grid. I think about, I mean, just our infrastructure in this country is in bad shape, period. 70% of large power transformers and transmission lines are at least 25 years old. Mm -hmm. 60% of circuit breakers are 30 years old. And uh, you mentioned the smart grid, and I think that's... They're starting to do some of it, but that's the solution going forward, right? Yeah. I mean, like, it doesn't matter where you are um, on the on the left or the right or in the middle. Everyone is like, yes, smart grid, smart grid. We need a smart grid. And that's basically like the grid we have now, but just slowly piecemeal um, improved little by little to add way more um, back and forth communication yeah. between the generators, the transmitters, the distributors, and the end user. Um, that it, there, And there's a lot more automated sensing built into this system, which makes the whole thing a lot more clever and um, makes like rerouting around problems a lot easier. But also one of the big things is making you and me and I and we um, a <laughs> lot more savvy about the energy that we consume from moment to moment. Yeah, I mean, there's that. And I also feel like the smart grid, most of it kind of falls under the banner of real-time micro uh, observance. Right. Whereas what we have now is very sluggish, yeah. very old-fashioned. I mean, it, it can be, it's like the difference between, you know, digital smartphone technology and like the, the old like crank phones from the old days. Basically, yeah. If there's a power outage, the way that the electrical generators find out about it is there's a series of towers where bonfires are lit from mountain to mountain. And they finally see one that's close enough, lit close enough, and they start to, like, ramp up production. That's how it happens now. It's amazing. (laughs) But there's also, so, I mean, you've got things like um, feeder switches that basically go around a problem area. If you've got Mm -hmm. a down transmission line, it can just go around it, and then, you know, it doesn't black everybody out. Um, uh, Smart meters, so you kind of see... Uh, how much energy you're using, and then also how much the price of energy is so you can actually save money if you want to kind of get into it in that granular level. And then also um, just making sure that um, that there's storage. That's the big challenge. We talked about that in our renewable energy episode with Bill Gates. Yeah. Storage. We Batteries. don't have anywhere to put excess, so we shuffle it around the grid. But if we have storage places strategically put around the United States, that would change absolutely everything. Yeah, as well as getting more direct use, which is solar. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually have a little solar project going I'm very excited about. Very nice. Uh, not for my house, but I know you know this. We have some... Uh, we have some acreage in North Georgia mm-hmm. on a river that uh, no house or anything. It's just land. There's just and, a van down by the river. <laughs> there may be a van one day. Uh-huh. But uh, it's just a it, – I call it the – we call it the camp. It's friends and family camp. And I'm I'm trying to style it out like a legit, like, state park campground. Uh-huh. Uh, and as of right now, as of like three days ago, I'm having a pavilion built. It's going to have three solar panels on it. And a little battery array. So I'm going to be able to power uh, like a, a big giant uh, ceiling fan under the pavilion nice. and like four quad outlets and like a coffee maker. Nothing huge. But he said the guy said it'll be enough for three or four days of full power mm-hmm. uh, and then like a day to juice it up. And we're never there for more than three days anyway. Right. So I'm technically going to have a little off-grid campground soon. You had me at coffee maker. <laughs> <laughs> and I should mention you got me a very nice – birthday gift that is going to live at that camp. I'm so glad you like it, man. I saw it and I was like, I I know exactly where this will go. And it went exactly where I thought it would go. What is the exact name of it? I don't have the box in front of me. Oh, man. It's a kindling splitter, basically. Yeah, it's like a log splitter. But it, but it splits it into kindling. So the coolest thing about it all is the story behind it. 